Okay. Um, so my name is Brendan Stone, and I'm the co-chair of the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War. And I'm going to bring this panel to order today. Um, it's called COVID-19, or coronavirus, and what it tells us about imperialism. Um, and uh, we have a very talented panel with us today. Um, now, I'm with the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War. We were formed at least 18 years ago in the lead up to George Bush's war on Iraq. And um, people in Hamilton are familiar with that history, of course. Um, we have subsequently opposed all of the wars associated with this so-called war on terror, whether it be the wars on Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, and Yemen, to name a few. And in addition, we have been in uh, solidarity with Haiti against the U.S. Canadian occupation there, 2004, 2006. And uh, we have done activity about Venezuela and the attempts to destabilize that country that are orchestrated sometimes right here in Canada, in Ottawa. So uh, we're involved in a lot of efforts to protect the world from our own imperialism, and that has only escalated and continues to escalate. Um, we survived the general downturn of the anti-war movement, and the way things are going, uh, we might have more friends to work with in the future. Um, out of concern for safety, um, we have canceled all of our in-person meetings. That includes the book launch that was scheduled with Eve Angler and other book launches about Palestine. Those have to get bumped back, unfortunately. Uh, we've moved online and that's to better reach you and we'll find other ways to reach you as well. So the most pressing global question today is the coronavirus and how the global system of imperialism is mediating its effect on the world and preventing, in many cases, the effective remedies. So we're fortunate to have three very knowledgeable speakers with us today. Uh, that includes Danny Haifong, Dr. Margaret Flowers, and Phil Taylor. And they'll be speaking until about 7.45, 7.55, 8 o'clock. But we, we're helping things move rapidly along, efficiently. We're not going to make it slow. In fact, our panelists will have 10 minutes each to start with. Um, they'll be able to um, explain what they're trying to get out there and across to the audience on these issues. And then there will be a five minute period in which the panelists can respond to the other panelists, what was said in those 10 minute segments. So they each get 10 minutes and then there'll be a five minute scrum. Then we're gonna open it up to questions and comments. Um, you'll learn more about that from Lucia. Uh, we're gonna need the comments to be no more than one minute each. And that will go on until about nine o'clock or even 9.30 if people want. But if you have to leave early, don't worry about it. Uh, we're trying to record this presentation for rebroadcast on YouTube. So hopefully that works out and you won't have to miss anything at any point. Uh, now, Lucia, um, before we start, is there anything that you wanted to explain about how this Zoom platform works as far as our speakers go or a little bit about the upcoming question period? Yes, the most important uh, thing for our participants is to know how to raise your hand. So we're going to do an experiment so that I know that uh, people understand what I'm saying. Just go down to uh, on the bottom of the of the screen is there is an icon that says participants. Click on the icon that says participants and a participant's panel with, will open in front of you. On the participant panel, there is, uh, it says more, where it says more, click on more and raise your hand. Everybody, please raise your hand virtually so that I know that, uh, that everybody can do it. <laughs> raise your hand as if you wanted to ask a question. I want to know that, that people is able to raise your hand. Please, everybody, raise your hand. I'm going to give the instructions again. Uh, about almost half of you have raised your hands, and there are a lot that don't know how to raise your hand. So I'm going to say the instructions one more time, 
And if uh, you still don't understand, you can still ask your questions in the chat, and I'll let you know how. So on the on the on your computer on the screen, where it, where the Zoom uh, window is, you go down to the lower panel of the Zoom window, and there is an icon that says participants. On that, I click where it says participants, and on the side, you will see a participant panel. Uh, on the participant panel, you click where it says more, and you will have the option to raise your hand. Can everyone do that, please? <laughs> okay. So those of you who, who uh, okay, I lower all your hands, uh, lower hands. So those of you who, you, uh, who uh, did not find the icon, you can always uh, write your question in the panel, in the, in the chat box. I will continually read the chat box. So you can uh, ask your question and you can let me know in the chat box. Uh, I, want to, to, I want to speak, uh, can you let me speak? Because I am the one that will unmute you and allow you to have your video in order to speak. So uh, if, if you're not able to raise your hand virtually, say so in the chat and I will uh, unmute you and let you speak. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Lucia. I think we're good to go and uh, we'll get a little I reminder. Will, I, I should repeat these instructions uh, also at the uh, question and answer session because we are, uh, a lot of people, new people are joining. So I will repeat the instructions again before the, the question and answer session. Yes, I was about to say. So um, we will <laughs> repeat the instructions about the hand raising. Um, otherwise, it's going to be the first half hour or so is for our panelists. And uh, we're actually on schedule. And so uh, we're going to be starting with our first panelist on the subject of coronavirus and imperialism. And the first panelist is Danny Haifong. And Danny is a contributing editor to Black Agenda Report. And he's a regular contributor to the American Herald Tribune. He is co-author of American Exceptionalism and American Innocence, A People's History of Fake News from the Revolutionary War to the War on Terror. And I think the Taylor Report interviewed him about that book. And Danny also visited China for two weeks very recently in late December. And that was prior to the escalation of the outbreak. He was there to study China and its socialist system. And he's going to be discussing today China's extensive measures to handle the outbreak and how and why the U.S. imperial response is so different. And he's also going to look at uh, Cuba's medical successes. So, uh, Lucia, I think we can hand it right over to Danny. Hello. Um, thank you all for coming out this evening and joining us. Thanks, Brendan, for that introduction. I'm going to start first with the uh, U.S. side of things. Um, you know, I wrote the book about American exceptionalism uh, a week from today it will be a year since it was released. And I didn't think that a year later after the book was released, I would be in the midst of a pandemic which completely shatters the ideology of American exceptionalism, which, which says that the US is a democracy and a beacon of freedom, a city on a hill, um, et cetera. Now we can see that all of that is a bunch of lies, um, that American exceptionalism was always a number of myths that was meant to keep the status quo intact. And right now the status quo of US imperialism means that there is no response to the coronavirus. There is no public health system in the United States. Uh, the monopolies and the banks that control and that ultimately wield the imperialist system to their benefit have made this a uh, stark reality. Uh, the US healthcare system is a for-profit system. All of the shortages that we see in masks, testing kits, ventilators have placed millions at risk 
And the United States just passed um, the rest of the world in the number of coronavirus cases today, um, and it hasn't even reached its peak yet. So uh, the various failures of the United States' leadership, political leadership, its imperial leadership, whether it's waiting weeks upon weeks to take the uh, coronavirus seriously and not uh, following WHO guidelines, World Health Organization guidelines around testing, really allowed the virus to spread without detection. And now uh, workers, especially in the United States, are paying for it. Uh, workers are being laid off in massive numbers. There are some estimates that say that unemployment here will reach 30%. And that was according to the US Federal Reserve in St. Louis. Unemployment insurance was just extended um, as of the so-called relief bill that was passed by the Senate and is going through the House right now. Um, but still, unemployment doesn't cut it. It's only 50% of wages. Many workers have historically not qualified, and it's unclear whether uh, those workers will be covered despite all the attempts to do so. But this doesn't change the fact that a significant number of workers were already just living paycheck to paycheck. One in every, every two people in the United States uh, live paycheck to paycheck, and they have debt from higher education, mortgages, car loans, etc. And those payments are all still on the table. People still have to pay them despite supposedly being asked to social distance. Um, I think what we're really learning here with the U.S.'s failure to respond to the coronavirus is that imperialism is really about the centrality of labor and the exploitation of labor. Um, once workers were ordered to stay home en masse in the United States, or at least suggested to, the capitalist economy immediately melted down. Uh, and now we're seeing, once again, like in 2007, 2008, which I think uh, this current bailout is making uh, look like small fries, that the imperialist system is really centered on finance and really centered on the interests of monopolies. And so when the interests of monopolies are not being served by responding to the coronavirus, we're seeing that the United States is political leadership has no interest in this, but they are capable of bailing out capitalist enterprises. They are capable like here in New York State of forcing prisoners to package hand sanitizer for the so-called coronavirus response. Um, we're seeing that the United States' imperialist system is still capable of waging a war on the world uh, at this moment. There has been no calls to roll back the military state uh, which is bombing and sanctioning countries all over the world and has 800 military bases uh, just ready to spread the coronavirus um, again and again and again. And I know other panelists will talk about the sanctions that are hindering nations like Iran from being able to respond to their own crisis. So this is what the coronavirus is teaching us, that U.S. imperialism um, still to this day even when there is this national and international crisis like the coronavirus pandemic, it, that it is incapable of responding to the needs of the masses and it's only capable of responding to the needs of multinational corporations and banks. So one thing that imperialism does is it robs us of the opportunity to learn from nations and to learn from alternative modes of social arrangements, alternative systems around the world and this could not be more clear with the example of China. So I just came back from China um, in mid-January. I came back on January uh, 13th, and I was there for a little over two weeks. This was before um, the coronavirus was making headlines. There were still investigations onto what it really was. No one was really talking about it. But you can see just how, when, you're, when I was walking through China, talking to folks, just how the centralized planned economy of China uh, ultimately prepared it for uh, the coronavirus outbreak. Uh, you can see across China that um, the state is really in command, that the biggest investments are in things like high-speed bullet trains and renewable energy and anti-poverty initiatives. And you couldn't walk anywhere in China, and we went from uh, northeast to northwest, all the way out to Arumchi, which uh, Arumichi, which is the capital of Xinjiang province, uh, you can see that this is a coordinated planned economy across the country. And so that's exactly what we saw with the coronavirus outbreak. 
in uh, January 23rd, residents of Wuhan, where the uh, virus hit hardest, um, citizens were placed under total lockdown. And this was just a day before uh, there were set to be 3 billion trips made across the country by, uh, uh, by the Chinese people to celebrate the new year. In other parts of the country, uh, there weren't necessarily total lockdowns, but a 14-day quarantine was imposed on anyone who registered a temperature of just over 99 degrees. If a person had contact with someone in Hubei province where Wuhan is situated, or had traveled outside of the country, that was mandatory for all people across China. Um, this quarantine policy was decisive in getting the outbreak under control. But here in the United States, while the ruling class was twiddling its thumbs, it was also criticizing these measure measures as authoritarian, draconian, and, a, and dictatorial. So as effective though as this, the quarantine policy has been, it was just one of the many measures that China took as part of a larger national patriotic health campaign. And I'm just gonna go over a few of those measures. Um, 40,000 health workers from all over China were sent to Hubei province. And they left just last week after uh, several days of recording zero domestic cases in China. And they received a hero's welcome for their service. Even the New York Times had to admit that none of the health workers thus far has tested positive for uh, COVID-19 during their time treating Wuhan and other uh, residents of China. Uh, there was some news about how two hospitals in China were built uh, to serve the uh, overwhelmed healthcare system in Wuhan in just a matter of days, totaling 2,600 beds. And overall in Wuhan alone, there was an increase of about 18,000 hospital beds over the last couple months. China is a high-tech giant, and it used its modern technology to gain an upper hand in this fight. Uh, drones were used to conduct thermal imaging. Robots were used across cities all over China to help disinfect public spaces and to help doctors diagnose and treat patients. There were apps, numerous apps created to um, cities across the China. Uh, QR codes were used to track people's whereabouts, temperatures, and the level of severity of the virus and the risk that um, it poses certain citizens and what measures they should take um, to ensure their safety. Um, one huge thing that needs to be uh, mentioned about how China responded to this, which um, is not really talked about here in the United States, is how the state-owned economy in China is massive. And it was able to, along with the central government, to redirect production um, in order to ensure that not only Wuhan had enough medical supplies, but the entire country had enough medical supplies to treat uh, people who were being infected. And that is such a beautiful example of what socialism can really do. And when the government is in command and when the people are in command rather than uh, private corporations, um, about 700 tech firms actually uh, were redirected to produce medical equipment. Uh, between the uh, new year, January 1st, and February 7th alone. And many other corporations began to follow suit after that. So I think um, what this all teaches us, what China's example teaches us, is that uh, we're in uh, desperate need of an alternative to imperialism. Uh, China is one such example of an alternative, but we've also seen that tiny socialist Cuba uh, despite being plundered of billions of dollars over the course of its revolutionary life by U.S. sanctions, has been able to coordinate with 37 countries to this day to help them with their own coronavirus effort. And they're working closely with China, um, as well as other countries around the world, to ensure that this response is an internationalist response to a pandemic and not one that leaves anyone behind. Uh, China's venture, actually, it's a joint venture with Cuba, produced, uh, helped produce interferon medications and 22 other forms of treatment that have helped thousands of people in China alone, including medical workers, protect themselves from contracting COVID-19. Uh, this is all in keeping with Cuba's tradition of medical internationalism, where 50,000, upwards of 50,000 doctors are living in around 66 countries 
across the world providing healthcare free of cost. So in summary, uh, you know, COVID-19 has exposed imperialism for what it is. It's a system predicated on the welfare of corporate profits at the expense of the people and the planet. The United States is the most extreme case of this, and we're not even uh, halfway through uh, this battle uh, with the coronavirus. When Trump laments or any other U.S. politician or functionary admits that the U.S. is just not structured to address this kind of crisis, none of them are lying. And so we're not going to be able to just demand that the U.S. government or any imperialist government do what is necessary. We know that the U.S. has the capacity to spy on everyone's electronic communications, create massive drone surveillance uh, capabilities to increase the size and scope of the national security state at a moment's notice but only if these measures protect the property of the rich and the profits that they seek. So I think that there are many tasks ahead that I think we can talk about. Here in the United States, we really need to build a mass movement right now that can make a set of transitional demands on the state. Uh, mutual aid efforts have to be built on. We have to begin organizing new institutions that replace the old imperial ones. Uh, but really, I think the biggest task is to develop a dues-paying organization comprised of the working class. Uh, unions must be defended at all costs, but they're just not going to bring us through the myriad of crises that COVID-19 has exposed. And then lastly, I think we need to make sure that the struggle against white supremacy and empire, which I talk a lot about in my book and I talk a lot about in my writing, must inform all of these activities. Too much of the left here in the United States and much of the Western world fails to do so, and that's why we can't learn from China or Cuba's heroic efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danny. Too bad we can't clap on this thing. Didn't really look into that possibility. Um, we'll have time to interact with the audience after our panel. Um, so thank you very much for bringing that personal perspective as well, having visited China and seen so many of the developments there, which are ongoing and we continue to receive articles about. So uh, yes, thanks and thanks to those clapping in the chat window. Um, that police siren is not on my and okay so um we have our next panelist coming up that is margaret kimber uh, sorry margaret flowers it is dr margaret flowers and she's a pediatrician who has practiced medicine for 17 years she's an advisor to the board of physicians for a national health program and the co-director of popular resistance where she also coordinates the health over profit for everyone or hope campaign she co-hosts the weekly podcast, Clearing the Fog. Now, some of you might have uh, heard about this via the Gray Zone or other independent media outlets, but Dr. Flowers was arrested last May after protecting the Venezuelan embassy in Washington, D.C. for 39 days. So she's one of the embassy defenders, and she's also a national co-chair of the Green Party. Now, Margaret is going to be addressing today the cruel sanctions that a number of countries have been facing. Iran is a prominent example. There's many other countries that are experiencing what are usually illegal, unilateral U.S. sanctions that need to be lifted at this time. So she's going to also look at how the United States has attempted to exploit this coronavirus crisis for its own ends, uh, particularly in trying to reduce China's standing in the world. And she can also speak on the failure of neoliberal health systems, uh, especially here in the global north, and more of what a people-centered healthcare would look like. So Lucia, if you can put Margaret on, we can switch over to our second panelist. Great, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, it's great to see everyone and see some friends. Uh, so I wanted to quickly just kind of follow up on what Daniel said, because the United States has switched its national security strategy from the global war on terror to what it calls great power conflict. And that great power conflict is mainly targeting countries like China and Iran. And we see, I mean, uh, Russia, and we see this um, you know, so starkly in the United States, you know, when the protests were happening in Hong Kong, which we know the National Endowment for Democracy 
was uh, stoking and has been investing in Hong Kong since even before the handover from the United Kingdom, um, there was all this, you know, members of Congress and media just saying how wonderful these protesters were and how they were fighting for freedom and democracy. And then, um, you know, since the coronavirus pandemic took off, we really have heard nothing about Hong Kong, but we're hearing a lot about how China, all these lies about how they weren't transparent or they're, you know, they can't be mentioned in the media without being called authoritarian and nefarious. And there was the false story about a doctor who was supposedly a whistleblower and, you know, and was a martyr because he died. And, and so all of this is just taking the COVID-19 and weaponizing it by the United States to further demonize and attack China's reputation. And, you know, it's dangerous for a number of reasons, as Danny pointed out, our failure to actually learn from China and benefit from its experience in successfully handling the virus. Um, but it also has really significant impacts on Asian Americans uh, living here who are being targeted uh, by bigotry, by, you know, violence, by uh, people not going to the to Asian restaurants out of fear and just all kinds of uh, ways that it hurts Asian Americans. So I just wanted to hold that out, um, you know, find kind of follow up on what Danny said, and, you know, just recognize that the United States is, has been losing its position as, you know, a, a dominant force in the world. And the actions that we're taking are just further, uh, you know, causing our power to deteriorate and for us to become more isolated from other countries. And, you know, instead of the Pentagon, which has a report out from a few years ago called the Post Primacy Report, uh, basically in that report, instead of saying, oh, we're losing power, maybe we should be a world player and start to cooperate with other countries, it said, no, we need to spend more on the military, we need to be more aggressive, we need to have more surveillance, um, and now we even have a space force that's going to try to dominate the world from space. So it's just all of the wrong things that the United States is doing. And I think that's really going to be to our demise. Now, uh, last year, I was also able to travel on two peace delegations, and one was to Venezuela, and the other was to Iran. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about the United States use of sanctions and how that is really hurting people in many countries, but particularly those two. Uh, you know, I'll highlight. But, you know, as, um, as Brendan mentioned, we call these economic measures sanctions in the United States, but in reality, they're actually technically unilateral coercive measures. A sanction implies that there was a process of, you know, a, a country or an entity that violated the law, and then sanctions are used as a punishment for that. But what these are is this is there is no process. This is just the United States unilaterally imposing these economic measures on other countries purely for the purpose of trying to weaken them so that we can either install, you know, a leader that's to our liking or get access to their resources or what have you. And so these unilateral course of measures are illegal. They violate the United Nations Charter. And, um, and the foreign minister of Venezuela, Jorge Ariaza, has called them collective punishment, which is also, you know, because they do hurt the people in those countries. And that is a violation of the Geneva Convention. And in fact, Venezuela has uh, gone to the International Criminal Court and, uh, you know, charging the United States with crimes against humanity for the economic measures they've taken against Venezuela. And on Clearing the Fog just this past week, we interviewed the United Nations independent expert, Alfred Desaias. And one of the questions we asked was, as you know, Iran is saying to countries to please defy the sanctions and you know, help them out in their crisis that they're facing. And uh, Alfred Desaias says that yes, it's, it's completely legal for countries to ignore these these unilateral course of measures because the measures themselves are illegal and so countries should be defying these measures and coming to the aid of countries like you know Iran and Venezuela and others and in fact you know we do see 
China and Russia coming to their aid. So, you know, we, we're looking for countries who recognize that they have the power, maybe they could start to band together, which I know there's some work being done through the United Nations and the um, non-aligned movement to, to do that, to start working together and kind of defying these illegal actions by the United States. But I wanted to mention a couple of things about these coercive measures and, and how they're harmful. And, you know, one thing we hear constantly in the United States is that, oh, you know, we don't have to worry about these sanctions or coercive measures because they don't apply to food and medications and basic things like that. But the reality is that they do prevent these countries from being able to purchase necessary medicines, supplies, food. And the way that happens is because the, the banks, the financial institutions don't wanna do transactions with them because they're worried about repercussions from the United States if they do. So even if Iran and Venezuela have the money to buy food, to buy medications, um, there are entities that are afraid to make those transactions. And then they also have real problems with transporting goods to them because you know shipping companies and others also are worried about these sanctions and the insurance companies that insure you know ships when they're transporting goods are refusing to you know give insurance to them when they're going to these places. So in reality, these sanctions are hurting the people of these countries. A study done by the Center for Economic and Policy Research last year found that just from 2017 to 2018, the sanctions on Venezuela contributed to the deaths of 40,000 people. And so sanctions are a form of warfare. They are cruel and they, and they do kill. And what we're seeing in this time right now when countries like Cuba and China are sending health professionals and supplies and medications to other countries, um, the United States is actually imposing more sanctions on Venezuela and Iran. And, um, and this is you know, hurting their ability to like in, uh, in Iran, we sanctioned some entities that were participating in the sale of oil. Well, oil is a major commodity in Iran and, and the sale of oil is how they make the money that they then can use to buy the things that they need. So uh, similarly with Venezuela, we recently sanctioned a corporate a company that was uh, kind of, it, it assists in the transactions of the sale of oil and like, in, uh, Iran, Venezuela has a huge amount of oil. In fact, Venezuela is the largest, um, has the largest amount of oil of all the countries in the world. And so um, these are hurting their ability, but despite that, they seem to be handling things pretty well. In fact, uh, Venezuela was very proactive uh, in taking steps to prevent and contain the virus from coming there. It's been very successful. They've, they were quick to get people into social isolation. They were quick to get people uh, signing up online to say how they were doing. They've been sending medical teams out to homes where people suspect that they might be ill. They've been able to get access to uh, tests through, you know, from China and from Russia. And so they are testing people and they've been able to put in place measures to protect people economically, to make sure that they are still having an income, you know, when they can't work. And so, you know, these are all like, like China did, you know, and Danny talked about Venezuela as a, a economy that's working towards becoming a socialized economy um, also is able to coordinate and take these measures to protect its people. And I just wanted to um, comment a little bit on the United States healthcare system. I think um, perhaps you have some experience or have heard about the United States healthcare system, but it's, it's a very unique of the wealthy nations of the world in that we don't have a universal healthcare system. And our system is pretty much based on profits. Even the public insurances that we have in the United States, Medicare and Medicaid are becoming increasingly privatized through, uh, Medicaid has these insurance companies that are contracted to provide this, you know, be the kind of the administrator for the system and they behave just like an insurance company and they deny treatment to people and make it difficult for people to get treatment. Uh, Medicare, uh, back in the 80s, we allowed private corporations, insurance companies to sell Medicare plans and they're very aggressive about marketing those and their plans are just like an insurance plan and, and do the same thing of denying and 
requiring high out-of-pocket payments and things like that. So we really have a very privatized system, a very predatory system, our pharmaceutical corporations and medical device companies. And we have in tens of millions of people, nearly 30 million people in the U.S. who have no health insurance at all. And then we have another about 60 million people in the U.S. who have health insurance, but they still can't afford to get health care. The health insurance requires such high copays or deductibles out of pocket before their benefits kick in that people have to make a financial decision about whether to seek health care. And people are afraid to seek health care because even with health insurance, you know, they'll play games with you. They'll deny it. They'll make you go through all these hoops to try to get your care paid for. They, in, different insurance companies have very narrow networks. And so if you're taken to a hospital and, and a lot of the inside the hospital, the departments, different departments are now kind of run by different outside kind of contracting companies. And so even you go to a hospital and maybe that hospital is in your network, but you come through the emergency room and that emergency room contracts with a company that doesn't, isn't included in your network. And so now you are stuck with the, with the whole bill for that visit, which can run in the tens of thousands of dollars easily for a visit to the emergency room. So about a third of people in the United States openly say that they are not seeking care, or, you know, avoiding it or delaying care that they need out of fear of the financial repercussions. We have over 500,000 bankruptcies in the United States every year uh, just due to medical illness. So um, we don't have, you know, because we don't have a system, we were completely unprepared for this pandemic, even though there have been warnings for a long time that something like this could happen. We don't have a centralized distribution. We don't have a way to coordinate getting resources where they need to go. And so uh, what we're seeing right now in the U.S. is first that the U.S. was very slow to take this seriously. The media in you know, some of the media were calling this a hoax or saying it's just like the flu or it's just like a cold and don't worry about it. And of course, President Trump was, you know, denying that this was anything to be concerned about. And, you know, so we didn't take it seriously and we didn't um, purchase the tests that were readily available from the World Health Organization so that we could start testing people. And we waited instead for the Centers for Disease Control and, and other various labs to make their own tests. And when the CDC finally made its tests and they went out, they were, they didn't work. So they, they couldn't be used. And so getting tested in the U.S. has been extremely difficult. They made the criteria very restrictive. And so even though we're the number one in the world now in cases, I think that the number of cases that are being reported are probably a, a huge, uh, you know, really much lower than what the reality is. Um, we also see things like the United States is investing a billion dollars in vaccine research to come up with a vaccine against the coronavirus. And yet um, they're going to turn that research over to a private corporation to manufacture and distribute. And the head of our health and human services, Alex Azar, who comes out of the pharmaceutical industry, refuses to say that it will be affordable or that it will be available to everybody. And so, um, you know, this is just a system that really doesn't value life, as Danny said, and it's, it's putting a huge strain on our health professionals. I'm not currently practicing, but I'm still in touch with a lot of my friends who are practicing, and um, they're really struggling. They're not able to get the protective, um, personal protective equipment that they need to protect themselves while they're seeing patients. New York City has been hit extremely hard, and uh, they're actually bringing in refrigerated trucks to handle the people who are dying to serve as like a morgue outside of the hospitals. Um, they don't have enough hospital beds. That's another part of our healthcare system is that we've actually been losing hospital beds over the years. Starting in 1975, we had 1.5 million hospital beds with a population of about 210 million. Now we have a population of about 330 million people, and we only have 925,000 hospital beds. We're seeing a closure of about 30 hospitals a year, and this is because they're not able to financially keep their doors open, and particularly in rural hospitals are closing down. 
We have about 453 rural hospitals right now that are at risk of closing down. And what happens when the hospitals get into difficult financial situations is that these predatory corporations come in and buy them and then they basically loot them however they're able to and allow them to go into bankruptcy and just completely fail. And then in many of our major cities, we see hospitals being shut down, particularly in communities that are low income or minority communities. And this is often because the land that the hospital is on is much more valuable. And this is happening particularly in gentrifying neighborhoods. The land is more valuable to be used for luxury condominiums or other sorts of development than it is as a hospital to serve people who are in need. So um, I don't, I, yeah, I should probably stop. I don't want to go too long, but I, you know, I'm happy to take questions about this and about you know, what we've been fighting for here in the United States. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Margaret. It's clear you have a very wealth of knowledge, sorry, a wealth of knowledge about the issue of medical care under neoliberalism in the United States in particular. And it's possible that during our question period, people might wanna ask more specifics about the ways in which it's been undermined or uh, the way it has fallen apart when tested by a crisis like this one. Well, in, in reference to all that, of course, we have our next panelist, and uh, that is Phil Taylor uh, from Toronto. Uh, Phil is a former investigator with the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, the ICTR, and he has approached many of our contemporary problems in the world from the perspective of Global South sovereignty and self-determination. And uh, of course, he's a public affairs broadcaster with uh, 89.5 CIUT in Toronto, uh, broadcasting on the Taylor Report Mondays from 5 to 6 p.m. He had also discussed the coronavirus crisis on the Friday morning show with um, its co-hosts on the uh, Friday 9 a.m. segment back in February. And that um, those two broadcasts are also available on the Taylor Report Facebook page at uh, www.facebook.com forward slash the Taylor Report. So um, he's been covering that outbreak and the subsequent responses. And what he wants to do is sort of riff off what the other panelists have said and kind of fill in the gaps there. And so uh, let us welcome to the panel, Phil Taylor. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me all, all right? Good. Um, well, I'm very impressed with the presentation. I'm very glad we're having the panel. We have a lot of work to do. Um, this matter of um, what we can learn. I think the people of the world are learning right in front of us. They're watching around the world. The Italians are watching. The Serbians are watching. The Greeks, certainly all across Asia, they're paying very close attention to the behavior of the great powers, such as they're, as they're called. And frankly, I think they're quite impressed with one of them. Uh, that is uh, China in this situation, because uh, the crisis developed first in China. And they, the world was uh, struck, I believe, by the fact that um, China took on all of its responsibilities towards its citizens, and then also towards the rest of the world. Um, their philosophy is noticeably different, I think, to world observers, in that they seem to believe that their job was to protect everyone and to contain and defeat this virus, this very deadly virus. They were joined in this in that uh, the World Health Organization identified the crisis. China shared with the World Health Organization all the information that it had. It also shared this information as the matter was becoming more severe and recognizable as, a, as something that could become a pandemic. Uh, they were very responsible. Once again, I think the world saw this, is seeing it the reflection we see, for example, in Italy, and I already mentioned Serbia, um, many other countries, of course, where China did two things. One, they accepted help 
asked for help and got help from many countries. And then they reciprocated in every way they could when other countries began to develop, uh, have a, uh, a problem. Uh, of course, most notably, we're faced with a country, the uh, center of the empire, Western imperialist empire, the United States. All it was concerned about was its power, its monopoly, certainly not to its own citizens. Um, very parochial, very uh, much hoping that the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans would perform their old magic of preserving the empire and making it easy to rule things. Uh, that because they're not interested in science, because they're not interested in medicine, because they're only interested in dollars and their own special status and triple homes and fortunes stashed abroad. Uh, they thought, well, they can weather it. When, when they said they, they thought of themselves only. But now the population of the United States is quite uh, frightened, as they, I think they should be, because they see, they look to their leaders and they're not seeing anything resembling a leader. Um, and they're also not seeing the, the simple human element of reciprocity, cooperation, mutual respect, working together to solve a common problem. Instead, they're, they're getting very nasty uh, rhetoric. Uh, we're reflecting the kind of system that the US uh, has. So I, and I think that uh, we in our situation be everywhere. We should be saying, what kind of system, what, what, are we what kind of systems are we dealing with? And the clue, of course, in China is it's called the People's Republic. And it took a lot of fighting, it took a lot of struggle, a century of struggle against colonialism and imperialism and Japanese invasion, uh, nuclear threats to the United States, uh, absolute hostility from the Western world uh, to build themselves up. And they did it in the name of the people. And that's why, I, you know, labels of countries are often just sort of shrugged off. There's nothing to shrug off. In, in this case, it is the People's Republic. Um, and believe me, in my opinion, this is going to have some, um, it's going to go over the heads of almost every party and author and thinker and whatnot. It's going to go directly into the eyes and ears and attention of the population of the world, and including the United States. Uh, now the United States has an economic crisis and it has a health crisis and it only has monopoly answers and, a, and the point of view of a small ruling group. Meanwhile, uh, in China, the philosophy of containing and defeating the virus has reached the point where the country of 1.4 billion people has no new domestic cases of this uh, COVID-19 because of the science and commitment to science and the commitment to the people and the commitment to organization and the, and the confidence of the population in a, in a leadership that has got them from being under the thumb of foreign powers to pass through a period of terrible shortages and having to live very, very poorly, but becoming organized, they become a very powerful country that delivers to the people. Um, and on this point of, will anybody notice? Yeah, I actually think that we, we have to say to people, uh, yes, you would be right to ask, why can't we have that? We have to get, we're in a period now where we have the parochial, arrogant, and bankrupt leaders of the West who can't provide for their own people, lecturing of people who are actually in a period of rapid, accelerating development. I'm not aware of the U.S. being able to develop, build whole new cities, and lift 600 million people out of poverty in a period of 10 years, uh, build highways, universities, and develop a great power and technology 
the question now has to be in the phony developed West is why can't we have that? And Trump is saying, I want you all to go back to work and no matter what. And meanwhile, they can look at a country of 1.4 billion that doesn't have coronavirus threatening its citizens anymore. It's a, it's a threat, I realize, but not the kind of pandemic matter that is struck now uh, in the West. I think you're going to see people asking, and this is, there's an analogy with the 1930s, when the U.S. went into terrible depression, the Western world, the Soviet Union actually didn't go into depression, actually. They provided work. They developed their industries during the 1930s. And it's a curious fact about American progressive thought and development of socialist ideas. The 30s were the boom times for that because they said there's a system there that actually provides for its people and is organized on the basis of employment, equality of peoples, struggle against racism, etc. Those were empowering things. I think the work of the Chinese, and I shouldn't, of course, I realize, I have to say also, most notably, Cuba, who, it's interesting, those two countries who used to argue with each other a great deal about what socialism is, both of them are now outstanding examples and, and providing comradely support for each other and, and working together to help other countries. So I guess what I would, um, I would take from this is people, are, we need to recognize that yes, uh, the tide went out and we find out that the imperialists were the fakers. They're the ones who are naked. And it's, it is the People's Republic of China which has been capably dealing with a problem. There are other states, certainly we have to notice like South Korea, uh, who's done a good job because they paid attention to the health of their citizens, maybe because North Korea to, doesn't have the corona and, and also has a social system that serves its people. You know, the presence of a, of, a, of a system that works alongside one that doesn't has a kind of medicinal effect. And people think, you know, maybe we should emulate that. A great deal of progress was made in the 1930s because the imperialists thought they had to show that they cared a little bit about the workers for fear that the poor and others would say they want that. And I believe they're going to want this now. Uh, and let's get down to the point about how to achieve that. We now should ask, why are we having a Cold War? There is no basis for any Cold War. There is no basis to be robbing the people of Iran of the ability to survive for their medical patients to survive. There's no excuse for that. We've gone from being punitive to being inhumane, cynical, brutal. We should say we want an end to the sanctions on the Islamic Republic, end to the sanctions on Syria, make, develop, diplomatic relations with all states when you and treat them as equals. Do not talk down to them. Do not think you have the right to name a virus when they, all the world says that it is a COVID-19. No one gives the imperialists the right to name anything. It shows their, their nature. They have to be in charge. So everybody's going to have to use the word they use. Those days have got to come to an end. We want, we want to go to where all socialists in history, I speak as one of them, I hope, said that we, our goal is to have human history. And when you have nation against nation and class against class, that is not human history. That is Cain and Abel. We have to get beyond Cain and Abel and recognize that these countries, Russia, China, Cuba, Venezuela, Iran, Syria, all reach their hand out to us, perfectly willing to cooperate. All that's going wrong is we have a dirty little group that thrives on war and aggression. And we have to say, no, this virus teaches us right now, we need a cooperative spirit, friendship between peoples. I think I probably talked enough. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Phil. Um, and I know you got to uh, discuss this in a commentary back on Monday on, on your program. 
it's still running, uh, even though no one is going into the studio. And we'll see how those technical issues are resolved in the coming weeks as we got programs in Hamilton, Toronto, uh, going forward that need to talk about the coronavirus and the response. Um, and uh, anyway, that will be available. And I guess we're going into a more uh, chaotic potentially period because uh, before our question period, we are having a five to 10 minute scrum uh, of the panelists um, because issues were brought up in which uh, other panelists might want to respond to what someone before or after them said on a particular subject. So we're going to let people just sort of um, talk, ad address issues and points that you wanted to uh, bring up in this final part before the question period. So we're going to unmute the panelists or if you can unmute yourselves uh, and put your video on, uh, you guys can just um, have a bit of a discussion there on those issues uh, before our question period. Um, I can speak first, if you all don't mind. Um, so yeah, great. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, Phil, those were great talks. I want to just bring up a few points. Uh, you know, the foreign minister of Iran uh, posted on Twitter not too long ago, just the dire needs that the same, the so-called sanctions, but really the unilateral measures, as Margaret was talking about, have uh, done to Iran's capacity to address uh, this virus. Um, we're talking about, you know, being short a thousand ventilators, being short uh, three uh, thousands of masks, uh, not having enough CPAP machines uh, in the in the thousands. So just severe shortages uh, that are produced by these sanctions, and. Um, one interesting thing that I saw in the corporate media today on MSNBC was that they were celebrating all of the nurses and healthcare workers here in the United States that are literally being left to die and to catch this virus uh, because of the failures of the healthcare system and imperialism generally. Uh, one thing that they didn't mention as part of the heroes uh, portion of the coverage was how Chinese billionaire Jack Ma actually donated a significant number of masks, a million masks and 500,000 test kits to the United States, uh, not a week, uh, I think a little over a week ago. And of course, he, um, because he's a billionaire, he's a member of the Communist Party of China, he was not mentioned as a hero, even though um, under the direction of China, and I think this is really important to understand about China, is when I was there, it was, it was pretty obvious. You know, I think a lot of people, especially on the left, think that China is controlled by capitalists now um, and that people like Jack Ma are actually in control of society. But when you go, you notice actually that most of the economy is state-owned and even the private enterprises work under the direction of the Communist Party and under the direction of the central government overall. Um, and nothing uh, could show this more than how Jack Ma has uh, behaved um, in this crisis, not only did he donate all of those masks to the United States, but also he sent a comparable number of testing kits and masks to every single country in Africa. 200,000 test kits, 100,000 masks, and 1,000 protective suits for every single country, regardless of population, regardless of their need. He sent them there, um, of course, under the direction of the Chinese government. So that, that just speaks to the difference in China what we have, and I hope that people in the United States and across the Western world will see that rather than in our context, in our imperial context, corporations make policy, banks make policy. Um, in China, uh, capitalists are only allowed to exist so long as they follow the policies of the government, which is in control of the Communist Party and is a socialist government. That's the huge difference between the two, and I hope um, as this crisis escalates here, I, I don't have much optimism about how bad it's going to get in the United States. I think it's set to get a lot worse. And um, the best thing that could come out of that is uh, people will be searching for an alternative to this system because both corporate parties and the entire U.S. imperial apparatus and its Western friends are just incapable of doing anything about it. Yeah, if I could follow up on what Danny said. So um, in the United States, what we're seeing is price gouging. And, you know, we're seeing that hospitals are, there was a hospital in Georgia that was out of masks and the CEO was desperate to get the masks. And 
Uh, he only found a company that was willing to sell them at $7 a mask when they're normally 58 cents. Similar kind of thing, a director of an emergency room in New York City was desperate uh, for masks for their healthcare workers and he ended up buying a thousand masks out of pocket and had to pay six dollars and fifty cents for those. So, you know, and um, the, the federal government has basically said to the states, you're on your own on this. There's no like bulk purchasing of what we need and then making sure that it's coordinating and getting to where, you know, the states that are hit the hardest. The states are literally like in a bidding war with each other to try to get the supplies that they need. And so you know, this is hurting our health. We're seeing price gouging, particularly in poor communities, at least where I live in Baltimore, what I'm hearing um, from people is that the prices of basic foods like eggs and milk are tripled. And so they're struggling. And, and in fact, right now um, in my neighborhood, we're collecting food supplies and donations to get down to some of the public housing communities because they're really hurt. And the, and the city has not opened up the there's they're talking about opening up uh, kitchens you know schools to feed people but they haven't done that yet and so people are really struggling here but i really agree with what danny said about um this is an opportunity at popular resistance we've been writing for a while about the 2020s as a decade when a lot of crises were really going to come to a head and it would be an opportunity to really uh, transform the systems in which we live as people see that they are failing. We, we never expected it would happen like immediately after 2020 began, but here we are and we are seeing, you know, people pushing back. We, we got this, you know, bill that's coming through Congress and it's completely inadequate and, and people are criticizing it. And, you know, some of the unions are standing up to it and saying, no, if we're going to bail out these major industries, then we need to set caps on how much money the CEOs can make. We need to make sure that the workers are protected. People are calling for equity in the industries that we bail out so that we're getting something for the money that we're putting into them. We've already seen over the past two years in the U.S. Uh, a significant rise in the number of workers who are going on strike and particularly wildcat strikes and and really militant strikes where, you know, they're not willing to go back to work until they, you know, get something. So that has been increasing in the U.S. And, you know, even in immediately in, in our community in, in Baltimore, people started circulating a kind of a list of demands. <laughs> These are the things that we need and hundreds of organizations in the city signed on to that calling for, you know, a moratorium on water shutoffs and power shutoffs and making sure that, you know, our small businesses are protected and, you know, all these kinds of things and, and, and making sure that people are housed, you know, we could house everybody. We have in Baltimore seven vacant homes for every person who doesn't have a home. Um, you know, so these are, these are problems that we could easily solve. And so I think that, you know, as we, as we understand, and I think in the U.S., while there is a lot of, there's super majority support for a lot of these different changes um, that, you know, people want, like higher taxes on the rich and protecting workers and things like that. Um, but we don't really have an organized left that has the kind of power to to make these demands. And so I think that puts a real responsibility on us, because if we don't have that power to make these demands, then we know that in this type of a situation of crisis, it actually allows those on the right to actually strengthen their position and to pull us further in that direction. So uh, it is an opportunity, but it's something that we have to be prepared for and organized for. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mark. Oh, Phil, did you have something? Yes, um, am I on there? <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, I like that last point, particularly to, because I think that um, we are in a situation where we're going to have uh, some confrontation. It won't be led by people we pop popularly think of as uh, progressives or socialists, unless Bernie wants to jump in. I don't know if Bernie's going to do anything. So far, no, he hasn't been very impressive. But he, he got a nice program. Maybe we could get it you know, out in front of people. They sh th that really should be the attitude. Uh, I agree with the previous speakers. That that's, um, people should say, okay, I'll go back to work. You give me a medical system that protects me, 
start building hospitals right now in every city, ex uh, uh, sufficient beds for any crisis, uh, put money into uh, training people in every field of medicine. That would be one of the things uh, we would uh, expect. And uh, an economy that guarantees us uh, uh, work and wages, um, but also a, a, a state that uh, is committed to our security. I don't mean again, foreign wars, I mean security in our homes, in our employment, uh, in which we have power. They, and what has been described previous is true. It's a it's concentration of power is such that um, there is no representation actually of, of what we would call working people uh, within the economy. Uh, of course, we should want the whole thing. We could ask for that, or we could demand it. But it, um, nobody should cooperate with this uh, current government if it's not going to deliver on the needs of the people in a minimal way. And I, I do think that uh, part of our, you know, this outlook at the beginning of the show is, so what are we learning? I, I think that people are learning there are states in the world that care about the people. And uh, it's, again, it's an, an old expression, I want what he's got, what she has, we want that. And if you're not going to come across with it, we're not going to cooperate. America is, of course, a regionally divided country. And of course, Canada, by the way, is an appendage. It's a vassal state, does as it's told, although the Canadians are getting more and more uncomfortable with the way they're being treated. The U.S. Army showed up on the Canadian border. They, we didn't know that was going to happen. So, wakey, wakey, as they say. Um, but we do have to, I would say we need uh, with Bernie's um, socialist program, as he argues for it, plus a rational foreign policy. Rational foreign policy is diplomacy, mutual respect, mutual assistance, and we should demand that. And we should demand to know why we're in a Cold War. People keep using this expression, the new Cold War. I don't remember any vote about it. I don't, I don't remember anybody debating it in Parliament. I don't remember anybody debating it in the US Congress. Everybody just says, oh yeah, the new Cold War. No, no, no new Cold War. Go to hell. Give us, we have every reason to get along with these people. You don't give us any reason other than something produced by Amnesty or Human Rights Watch or Medicine San Frontier who are hirelings of the State Department, they tell us who we're supposed to attack. All those people, by the way, at this moment are being shown up to be bankrupt, running errands for the State Department. They may as well be Pompeo's nephews, the way they behave. Each one of them has to say something insulting about a foreign state struggling to survive. I hope they get trampled out during this process because they really have been exposed badly. Anyway, that's my five minutes. Okay, it sounds like everyone had a lot to say. And it also brings to mind, brings up certain questions about NATO and the politics of masks. Maybe I'll ask a question later. Um, and certainly, I really took to heart what Margaret said about the chickens coming home to roost. This is almost like a decade of roosting. It's like roosting decade. This, this is all coming out now. It's, it's, it's all coming apart. Um, anyway, uh, that concludes our scrum. Uh, the panelists were able to respond to some of the points the others made. And we're going to move on to our question period, which is more complex. Um, before we do that, um, there is a note about fundraising. Um, uh, of course, it did cost money to set up this panel and the technical work behind it and to do future events. So if you are able to contribute, uh, we have some information on, on how that can be done. Um, Lucia, if you can take us to the, the fundraising section. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, this is the point uh, at which we would start passing our big red hat if we were having a meeting at New Vision United Church downtown. Um, and uh, as the treasurer of the coalition, I uh, still have that responsibility. And so I'm asking everyone, if you can, please, um, please send an Interac uh, email transfer to the um, 
There it is on the screen right now. Uh, if you support the work of our coalition, please send a interact email transfer and uh, any amount would be appreciated. And thank you very much for coming out to, to tonight's panel. Enjoy it. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, for those who might have had the text covered up by some video sections, um, you can actually find the text at, uh, well, I'll give you the email address. It's hcsw at kojako.ca. So that's uh, hcsw at kojako.ca. You can see it in the chat window there if you uh, turn over uh, to the chat window. So uh, now we have our question period coming up and I think we're gonna have to switch over to Lucia. Um, Lucia is gonna tell us about the hand raising again, just how you can digitally raise your hand, especially for those who came into the meeting a bit late and um, how we're gonna conduct the question period um, in terms of procedure or, or just switching to people, Lucia? Hi, everybody. I'm here to help uh, unmute people. Uh, so in order to raise your hand, uh, there are many new people, actually. So those who uh, already heard it, you're going to hear it again. Uh, in order to raise your hand, go on the Zoom window uh, with your cursor, go down, and find the icon that says participants. Click on the participants icon and a participants panel is going to open on the side. On the participants panel, there is a, a section that says more and on the more uh, button, you click more and you will see the option to raise your hand. So if you have a question for the panel, please raise your hand in this way and I will un call your name, unmute you, and allow your video so that you can, <coughs> uh, so that we can see you when you ask the question. And if you still don't know how to do it, then um, do it in the chat. I will also read the questions from the chat. So we have our first uh, uh, question from uh, David. Uh, David, can you speak? No. And can you, do you have a video? Yeah. Uh, can you ask your question, David Rennie? Yes. Um, well, I agree with everything the panelists said. Uh, but I hope they're familiar with the MK Ultra program. I'm just leading up to my question. The MK Ultra program was mass experimentation by the US authorities uh, on a population unwittingly of uh, biological agents. And I hope they're also familiar with the Tuskegee experiment, also experimentations in, in Latin America against peasants like in Guatemala, and also, uh, Germ warfare against uh, Cuba, they were sabotaging the livestock down there, trying to destabilize the government by ruining their agriculture. That's being proven. So a lot of progressives now, they wouldn't put it past them when they hear, I believe, authorities in China and uh, Iran say that it was an experiment directed against, well, initially China, Wuhan area. Maybe it got out of control, but... Uh, in the West, uh, a lot of progressives, some agree, some disagree. Uh, it's causing a lot of debate on that. So I was just wondering what they think of this issue. The U.S. could be behind a lot of these, this experimentation. I'm finished. Who's first? <laughs> I, guess, um, I, I can start if that's okay. Um, I am familiar with the programs that you mentioned, and you know we certainly don't put it past the United States 
to engage in this kind of behavior. I have not seen anything yet, though, that shows, you know, that this is the case in this situation. So I think it's really the question is still out on that um, is, you know, whether this was a case of, I mean, the U.S. has been trying all sorts of ways to undermine China and many other countries, but I don't know yet that we have the, any kind of proof that that's the case in this situation. And, and the reality is that the, the world is at risk for pandemics and, um, and particularly with the climate crisis, that's going to escalate. And so it's really hard to know exactly where, you know, what is behind this. Over. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add to that a little bit. Um, I know that um, the Foreign Minister of China uh, insinuated that um, the United States may have been behind it, but I think we read it a little closer. I think what he was really saying was that the United States should stop calling the coronavirus the Wuhan virus or the China virus because there is still yet to be verified proof that it started in China. And I think he was making a political calculation that, hey, look, you were in Wuhan at this time participating in the military games. You guys were sick. It could have happened like that. But I, I think that one dangerous thing that can happen <clears throat> in terms of the credibility of us anti-war activists and anti-imperialists is when we, um, without uh, verifiable evidence yet of, of such claims, uh, begin to go down these um, these avenues that don't lead to any, I don't know, material, real material response. It doesn't help us uh, here in the imperialist orbit organize to ensure solidarity with China, as well as the things we need to do here to make sure that people have what they need um, to get through this, but also to move us in, in a much more, uh, you know, much better direction for um, our class and, and the people um, who are most affected and exploited by, by this crisis. Yeah, okay. Uh, thanks, Danny. Um, we're just looking at the hands. Uh, Lucia's doing a lot of the picking, just looking at who puts up hands first. Um, uh, we're going to go with who we saw first and then um, maybe try to get, make sure we're getting all walks of life represented in our questions. Um, I, the first person uh, after David I saw raise their hand was someone, a gentleman named Furquan, I believe. Uh, can, can we activate Furquan? Yes, uh, hi. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, I actually posted my question in the chat as well. And basically, it's uh, uh, what mechanisms currently exist in the global system to stop these illegal sanctions? And uh, uh, what additional mechanisms are needed? Are, are, are the ones that we have sufficient or do we need additional ones? I could start unless someone else wants to. <laughs> I mean, um, the you know we have the International Court of Justice, which is part of the United Nations, um, which could theoretically be used. They did rule against the United States on the um, secondary sanctions impacting Iran, and but the U.S. doesn't comply with that. And, and we had this discussion with Alfred Desaias from the United Nations this last week on our podcast and and you know the problem is that the international criminal court which venezuela has filed a suit in um the united states is not part of that so you know there really is not an enforcement mechanism right now i'm encouraged by the non-aligned movement because that's over 120 countries that are kind of coming together and i think that individually countries you know, unless they're like Russia or China are afraid to stand up to the United States. But I think in numbers, in collective action, perhaps we could start to see some of that. And um, yeah, so we definitely need some structures that, you know, particularly targeting countries like the United States that just act completely with impunity and get away with it. <coughs> I'll just add a little bit to that question too. Um, the United States sees itself as the international law of uh, the land. And I, and I think that all international institutions that exist right now will either be threatened by the United States, whether it's what happened and what continues to happen with uh, organizations like ALBA that's led by Venezuela, 
um, or any other of the non-aligned uh, movement as well um, are all hindered by the fact that the United States does not uh, respect international law and it doesn't even see international law as valid. It sees itself as the law. And so until that is addressed, um, every single alternative is going to be threatened or endangered by it. Okay. Our next uh, person in line is Alison from Vancouver. Can you you can ask your question. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Alison Bodine, the chair of Mobilization Against Foreign Occupation here in Vancouver. First of all, thank you to the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War for organizing this. I think uh, we are all running through our minds about how to continue up our, our anti-imperialist and anti-war organizing at this time. And uh, in Hamilton, you are very active and we are very active here, especially with street protests. And so now that that's been taken out of our hands, we uh, need to come up with other ways to collaborate. So of course, if any speakers uh, have any comments about that, that's much appreciated. Good to hear from all of you as well. Um, I just wanted to highlight two things. One is that I think uh, COVID-19 also exposes the war uh, that Canada wages and that the US wages on people at home, mm -hmm. which we've said in different ways tonight, but to articulate it that way I think is important, especially the way that, for example, in Canada, Indigenous nations are treated at times of a pandemic um, where they're not given the same rights of social isolation as the rest of people across Canada when uh, massive resource extraction projects continue on their territories um, and man camps continue on their territories uh, despite the pandemic and the threat of really having masses of people close together. Um, I think also it's important when we're here in Canada to talk all about Canada's sanctions. So Canada has continued their sanctions regime against Iran and also against Venezuela at this time. And so when we talk about US sanctions, um, I think it's always important that we continue talking about Canada's sanctions. So there's a few online petitions that we've come across um, and I'll share them in the chat box if anyone wants to share them as well related to these sanctions. And just for the speakers, if, if you have any um, ideas about continuing our cross-border uh, collaboration, especially that this time when it comes to uh, building a campaign against imperialist sanctions on countries around the world that are fighting the pandemic. Thank you. So that's, um, thank you for talking about the Canadian sanctions. And, um, you know, that's a question about how to organize in this time is, is one that we're all talking about. And of course, many are doing like you're doing and moving into an online format, um, we have seen people doing, there was a protest in New Jersey, I think it was last week, where they were targeting an ICE, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement Detention Center that's refusing to release people who are being detained there for their safety. Mm -hmm. And so they uh, did a car protest where people drove around, they surrounded the detention center and drove around it, you know, honking their horns and, and making noise and, you know, shutting down the streets that way. Um, one thing that we should be thinking about, Vijay Prashad wrote an article recently, we have it on Popular Resistance, um, talking about the unilateral course of measures and an international day of action, or actually week of action at the end of May, May 25th to 31st. And so we ought to be thinking about ways that we can mobilize around that. Um, organizations here like Code Pink have been doing petitions. They did a very small, protests with just a few people wearing protective gear outside of the treasury, um, you know, calling for an end to the sanctions. And so we're all kind of scratching our heads right now and, and trying to figure out how, you know, how do we do this? In fact, I dreamed last night that I was occupying the State Department. So, you know, but uh, those kinds of things are, you know, hard to do in this time. So um, I think we're all still kind of trying to figure it out. Okay, uh, that's a very good answer. And if uh, 
there's no f uh, further panelist responses to that question. I understand Miguel has been waiting for a long time to get his question. Uh, so Lucia, if you could transfer us to Miguel, if he's ready. Hi, yes, can you hear me? Good, thanks. Um, yes, I hope this uh, doesn't uh, uh, go beyond the scope of this discussion, but I wanted to raise a question and get the views of the panelists. Kudos, by the way, to all of you. I thought you did a wonderful job in your presentations. Um, um, but get your views uh, concerning the, uh, the, the uh, current um, economic crisis and the impending uh, recession, if not, in fact, a full-fledged uh, depression uh, which even uh, bourgeois economists, uh, I'm not talking about the talking heads on television and on uh, CNBC, but uh, a lot of bourgeois economists uh, concede the fact that at least a deep recession is at this point uh, unavoidable. The um, reason I raise this, of course, uh, is that uh, uh, for working people in particular, um, both in Canada and the United States and, and elsewhere in the world, are being uh, hammered not only as a result of the um, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, inadequate health services being um, robbed at the, at the uh, checkout counter because of uh, uh, inflated prices, uh, et, cetera, et cetera, and of course, loss of immediate income, um, but also the fact that we know from the last meltdown in 2008, that's something in the order, different estimates, 7 trillion, 10 trillion, some have suggested even higher than that, of uh, public uh, funds, uh, so-called quantitative easing uh, and bailouts to, uh, to monopoly and to the corporations um, uh, were used. And if, if in fact this crisis is more protracted and deeper than even 2008, which I'm inclined to think will be the case, um, we could have, uh, you know, 20, 30 trillion dollars of uh, public funds being uh, used to buoy up this system, uh, and, and particularly the, the ruling circles in this uh, system. And the big issue there will be who's going to pay for that crisis, just like it was in 2008. So not only are working people confronted with the immediate situation, but also down the road in the terms of even further and deeper and more painful cuts to the social infrastructure and social safety net, for lack of a better term, um, uh, cuts to uh, real uh, wages and incomes, um, and of, of course, uh, higher taxes. So I, I, I and, that, and that of course begs a, even a larger question about how the working class and working people um, can organize in these particularly unusual circumstances yes. to, pro to fight back and protect their interests. That's it. <laughs> Does someone else want to go first this time? <laughs> if not, I'm happy to comment, but I don't want to keep hogging it. You want to go first? Or <laughs> no, go ahead, Phil. Um, well, I like that question very much uh, because um, I think we um, just, <laughs> it's a wonderful question, how are you going to get them organized? But one thing's clear is that um, ideologically, they have suffered a tremendous strategic setback. Uh, that is to say, our monopoly gang in, uh, in Washington and in Ottawa, uh, they've been selling austerity, they've been lecturing, they say you can't have this, you can't have schools, you can't have hospitals, you can't have education. And uh, it's actually all those things are only for the rich and uh, etc. Now all of a sudden they reach uh, into the sky and they pull down a trillion dollars or three trillion or four trillion for themselves. And it's rather easy to mount a uh, counterattack in my opinion that provided we can push our so-called labor leaders and so-called social democrats and everybody else to come forward and say, listen, you guys have uh, messed it up. You, now you tell us you have this money, so now it's going to have to come to us. And, we, and look, we have Cuba, we have uh, the Islamic Republic, we have Venezuela. 
we're involved in uh, trying to starve them, and meanwhile, we're starving ourselves. It, this is a very ignorant position. Uh, if we were to go back a year ago, uh, we had a prime minister who said, I really want to get along with China. I'm so fortunate to have them investing in our country, Huawei. They have, are providing uh, institutions, paying for them, training people, and we're all benefiting. And I look forward to more business. And then Washington phoned the prime minister and he nearly fainted. He went into an act of, of total hostility and ignorance towards a country that is not looking to take us over, but to, to do some business. I think we, we have to revisit that and tell them that the only reason we're in this box is because the Washington crowd wants us in the box. We have, it's gonna take a lot of guts because uh, Ottawa is not historically in, in the habit of defying empire, whether it's the British or the Americans. But at least we, working people, we ought to just tell the truth to one another. Hey, look, we'd be better off. Well, let's open up the trade. Let's uh, get the investment. When the General Motors went down, people said, you know, the Chinese like to make electric vehicles. How about talking to them? Tell the prime minister, phone them up. But the only reason he doesn't is because he's afraid of Washington. So a little frank discussion would help us, but we definitely working people ought to say, get us away from that sinking ship that Washington is running because it's gonna take us all down with it. I can add a little bit um, as well to the question or to the comment. Um, the Federal Reserve right now is openly admitting that it can print out as much money as possible, as much money as the so-called financial markets need, uh, big finance capital needs to survive this crisis and any crisis that comes afterward. And that the Federal, the chair of the Federal Reserve is literally arguing that this money won't come from taxpayer dollars because they can just print it out of thin air. And so with that admission comes both uh, a big danger in the fact that uh, finance capital has become so volatile and imperialism is so volatile that these crises are going to become bigger and bigger and bigger and that that sort of response only feeds it. But also, why can't working people demand that money be printed out for them? Uh, in the United States, the stimulus bill will be a $1,200 one-time payment for people making an individual making $75,000 per year or less, or a couple making $150,000 a year or less, it's absolute pennies compared to the trillions that uh, big corporations and the banks are receiving. So uh, there is an opportunity there at just the raw social democratic class struggle level of um, exposing how fraudulent that is and how insulting it is to ordinary people who are seeing their uh, livelihoods and seeing their conditions decline every single decade, every single year. If I could add just a little bit, um, I mean, here in the United States, you know, the, the COVID-19 was a, a trigger and the oil war, you know, the drop in oil prices, they were triggers that, that triggered this recession, which I agree is probably gonna be prolonged and, and likely, you know, could be a depression. But the fundamentals, as they often, you know, say in the corporate media, you know, fundamentals are sound. The fundamentals in the United States are actually incredibly weak. And, um, you know, we are a country of incredible debt, it, personal debt, you know, student debt, medical debt uh, is very high. People in the United States, uh, there's, you know, 40% poverty and people can't afford, you know, a $400 emergency. They don't have the liquid assets on hand to manage that corporate debt is extremely high. Um, the tax cuts that the president gave to the wealthy, uh, basically the wealthy used those for stock buybacks and allowed their debt to be incredibly high. And so they're relying on the Federal Reserve to rescue them, um, as well as there's all these, you know, the derivatives and, and those kinds of risky investment tools or whatever they are, you know, they're, inc they're huge. They're like, uh, my understanding is they're like 10 times the global GDP is what's at risk out there in these various forms of, of toxic assets. Um, and in, in our government debt is very high too. And so we're just in an incredibly weak position. And I think that this is, 
is already exposing, I mean, people for the, in, since the Occupy movement, there's been a lot of public discussion about the country being run by the moneyed interests and how the policy has always helped the wealthy and they're not for us. And I think we've been seeing a lot of organizing since then. It's not, you know, talked about mostly in, in the corporate media, but in alternative media, you'll find it, independent media. And um, I think this is a huge opportunity for us, like I said before, but we have to we have to put forward a bold vision of what it is that we want to see, something that will inspire and draw people to organize around it. And, um, and that's you know, going to require a lot of work on our part to do that education and to do that kind of mobilizing. I'm hopeful that there's a possibility of that. And you mentioned Phil Bernie Sanders um, as a national co-chair of the Green Party. I would be remiss, be remiss if I didn't mention that we have a presidential candidate, the one who um, looks like he's likely to win our nomination, um, we're in, a, in our primary phase right now, is Howie Hawkins, who is a socialist uh, from New York. And he's been putting out really excellent statements on all sorts of sectors of our economy, on elaborating a Green New Deal, which is, goes far beyond what we're seeing coming out of Congress and the Democratic presidential candidates. Um, and so I think that it, you know, I hope that through his campaign, it'll be also a tool to educate and mobilize people. And, and the U.S., you know, the Democratic Party putting Biden out there, it's a really interesting time because uh, many people, like they did last time when Hillary Clinton was a nominee, are, you know, are saying, I will never vote for this person. So, um, you know, we just have to keep doing what we're doing, educating, organizing, and mobilizing. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Margaret. Uh, we do have a several more uh, questions. Um, and I've been asked to ask one on behalf of an audience member who doesn't have a microphone. But before that, we were eaten to the punch by Hannah. There's Hannah uh, had, a, had her hand up first. Um, Lucia, if, if you could transfer us to Hannah. Um, yeah, hi, sorry, I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, hi, I was just wondering, um, this is actually my first event with you, although um, I've been wanting to attend events for a while with the um, Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War because I'm, I'm a McMaster University student. Um, but um, yeah, I'm thankful to uh, be able to participate now. And uh, just one question I had is, um, it's kind of generic, but in terms of, um, I don't know, engaging people in a lot of um, these very internationally based issues, I'm just wondering at a time like this, what some of, what um, kind of some proposed strategies for that might be given the possible um, increased tendency for people to turn more inwards towards domestic issues at a time like this as local hardships um, are intensified and increased um, during such times of distress. Um, and so with regards to things like international sanctions, I think, um, you know, we've seen maybe recently some complacency surrounding foreign policy issues in, in um, certain parts of the US and in North America, as people have um, increasingly redirected attention towards um, local problems that are of more immediate concern. So again, um, as we're in a, in a crisis like this, how do we redirect people's focus towards those um, international issues when their, yeah, their, their like, likely tendency will be to turn their, um, attention inwards. Go ahead, Danny. Okay. You first, Danny. Uh, well, that's a really, really good question. Um, I think in crisis or no crisis here in the United States, there tends to always be um, a tendency to not really pay attention to what the United States is doing abroad. And that's not uh, necessarily 100% the fault of uh, the people. Uh, it's, it's mostly the fault of the corporate media. It's mostly the fault of the Washington establishment. It's mostly the fault of the capitalist class as a whole uh, being very effective in not only hiding what it does abroad, but also when it does talk about foreign policy, it does so in a way that uh, pumps up Eurocentric and um, white supremacist tendencies in the US population, 
especially the white American population, and is able to mobilize people really to either, um, even if they don't agree, uh, not to resist it. And so in this time where people are becoming more and more desperate, working class people especially, are, are in a state of desperation. And there is a massive panic uh, just generally amongst the U.S. population, regardless of class. Uh, that is a big challenge. I think as my strategy, I don't know if it's the right strategy, but um, I have a tendency, uh, there was a joke when I was in China that we were, that there was a contingency of um, defend China no matter what contingency that we, we are going to be um, wholly um, unapologetic about our defense of China and our defense of the peoples of the world and their struggle um, against imperialism and um, that whenever we do talk about what's going on here in the United States, how we're struggling. Um, luckily now, uh, I think this is probably the most extreme example that I have been alive for at least, where we can actually say in public, well, you know, as much as China struggled with this in the beginning, they certainly aren't doing so now. Uh, why aren't we looking at that? That's, that's something that hasn't come, that opportunity hasn't come along very often. Um, because oftentimes what we're up against here is when we talk about Cuba's healthcare system, when we talk about uh, China's anti-poverty initiative, um, their war on poverty, when we talk about um, any country's successes outside of the United States, uh, usually the um, anti-communist and white supremacist uh, red baiting comes right out. Now, in this time where desperation, there's a kind of a two-pronged um, double-edged sword happening here where, yeah, uh, that may be ramped up because the Trump administration and the Democrats are all on board in their anti-China sentiment. But at the same time, China has succeeded on the world stage around this global crisis to a degree um, that you know I've never been alive for. Uh, I've never been alive for a crisis of this magnitude um, being addressed in the way that China was able to do it. So I mean, in that way, I think there's an opportunity now to actually be that uh, contingent of of the unquestionable defense of peoples around the world, especially in China, um, that we haven't had in a long time. So I would say whenever we're struggling around domestic issues, whenever we're trying to have that bold vision, come up with that bold vision and organize people, that we make sure that it's always part of our agenda to talk about this and to educate and to um, mobilize real actions. I mean, um, what could come out of this is an increased war against China. I think that is a very big possibility as the U.S., whenever it comes out of this crisis, who knows when that will be, but whenever it does, um, I think that threat um, increases exponentially because the U.S. ruling class will be looking for someone to blame. Um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's it your turn. <laughs> oh, okay. I was just going to add a little bit to that, and that's a great question. So th some of the things that I think that are really helpful, one is building international solidarity and uh, visiting places uh, is really important. It was really helpful to me to make connections with people in Iran and Venezuela, and I've been you know, to other places as well. And, um, you know, one thing that the U.S. does to kind of make it politically palatable to target other nations is to dehumanize them, make people from those countries be very scary. And so uh, even when I was going to Iran, I had family members saying, oh, be careful over there. Like it was some dangerous place. And the Iranian people are just the most wonderful, lovely people you can imagine. It's such a mature culture compared to the United States. And when we were in, um, you know, so being able to come back and tell those stories when we were in Venezuela, one of the things that they talked to us about, and Miguel, who asked the question, was on that delegation as well, um, is they said, you know, can you tell people about the positive things that we're doing, about the three million, you know, social housing units that we've built, about our food program, our healthcare, education, and so I've been trying to, you know, tell those stories as, as often as I can, but through tools like we have right now with Zoom, you know, we can do webinars with people from other countries and, and educate people in our countries about, you know, that these are people <laughs> that have shared many of the same values and desires that we do, uh, that they are doing things in an alternative way and, you know, and how our policies are impacting them, you know, that kind of building those relationships and education. And then the other thing that we've been 
really focused on in the United States is just building connections with how militarism uh, is connected to racism, how it's connected to militarization of our communities, how it's connected to the climate crisis, that we really can't solve the climate crisis if we don't address you know, militarism. And so I think making these connections, because we, you know, if we stay in our silos, we are not gonna have the power to succeed. We really do need to understand the connections between things and understand that we can't win one thing uh, alone, we really need to change a lot. We need to change pretty much everything to get things working in a way that has a positive outcome. I'll stop. Uh, yeah, I'd like to add to that. Uh, the the problem certainly uh, with the, in the U.S. politics and so, well, I should say Canada as well, is that. Uh, they always, uh, any political leader feels they have to go through a ritualized put down of other people. And they make a list of countries and they have one smart remark for each one of them. Uh, completely unproductive and usually a lie. Uh, and so it would, like we have a candidate like Bernie and I appreciate that he speaks about socialism and, you, and of course the Green Party candidate about whom I'm not so much aware. I did appreciate Jill Stein's work. And I, I will look into that. I would, but they ha we have to demand of them to please stop the game of demonization and, and, re and repeating State Department positions. It burns me up when and, uh, uh, snotty remarks are made about uh, China has a little problem with this kind of, it's got another one. Each of, certainly in Canada, we have saw problems hundreds, hundreds of years old towards indigenous people and everybody said, well, we'll get to work on that. Well, you know, it's time to get over this uh, conceit and the idea that we uh, can look down on other people and, and our attitude should be uh, cooperative. And we have to say, look out for the uh, intelligence agencies and look out for the Pentagon. They burn money like crazy, both of them, trying to do overthrow people. It's an easy rhetorical argument. People make it on the street. How come we got a billions and billions of dollars in, poured into military projects that nobody even knows what they are uh, when we, you tell us we can't have schools and roads and bullet trains and stuff like that? And we can't, we can't have leader, people pretending to be leaders who don't want to solve this problem and say directly, we don't need this kind of money and we bet this we need better relations with these countries. And I actually, I have to say, I didn't hear that very well from Bernie. I didn't like his interview with the New York Times where he talked about how he would be more punitive or as punitive towards China. Uh, and then he had the lecture, shake his finger in Putin's face. This is all absurd. Uh, we need uh, stand up, respectable leaders who say, oh, yeah, I'm gonna talk to that state. I'm gonna see what we can work out. And particularly if they claim to have progressive or socialist credentials, uh, Danny made the reference, it's really an old one. I mean, the, the fact is that all we're dealing with here is red baiting of the old school. And we ought to really laugh in the face of people who try to pull that on us. Uh, it's, it has no content. And, but, and you, but you cannot separate your domestic issues from foreign policy. If, if Bernie is gonna say, Oh, the intelligence is telling me the Russians are trying to, what we have to say, and I agree with Tulsi, it's the intelligence agencies, it's the Pentagon who's butting in. It's not the Russians and the Chinese. You don't even have any evidence. Provide some evidence. Don't come and tell me that you've been talking to a guy in a, in a raincoat in Russia and he told you something. No, no, you give us evidence. We're not gonna just take it on your word. You say, I'm a cop, therefore you gotta take my word for it. I thought we learned a long time ago, you couldn't take the word of a cop on face value. Okay, well, thank you, panelists. All three pitched in there. Um, to answer Hannah's question, I would also say, of course, that this event, it's called the coronavirus. And what does it teach us about imperialism? And I'm almost surprised Phil didn't say the old saying, which is foreign policy is domestic policy. Uh, they're one and the same. And that's how we ended up with this coronavirus situation in the first place here in the US and in Canada. Um, that is to say, it's the imperial system, the system 
of Euro-American white supremacy globally that is causing the poor reaction to this pandemic and helping create a pandemic in the first place. And it's also, if you're talking to people, why is it important to care about foreign policy? Why is it important to care about what's happening outside US or Canadian borders? It's because in the case of the coronavirus, we saw that the United States belittled China's response to the coronavirus. So when China realized the severity of how big that problem was, um, they built hospitals in a few days. They were able to quarantine entire cities. They were able to provide free testing to people um, and take all these measures so that they could prevent the spread of that disease within China. And what our countries did, especially the US and a lot of leaders took their lead from Trump, was to ignore the contributions China was making to the study of this virus because they provided information about the virus as soon as they had it. And it and was to belittle their response, to condemn them for all the things they did. And the consequence of that was that here in Canada and in, particularly in the United States, they thought, well, this is, China did not handle it right, is what they were saying. And they were backwards and sluggish and clumsy and authoritarian and totalitarian and so on. So the idea was we have nothing to learn from China, that Trump has nothing to learn from China and so on. And they learned nothing from China. And as a consequence, it looks like the disaster in terms of the spread of the disease will be worse in the United States than it was in China. You saw that in Italy, um, there's more dead in Italy, small Italy now, than there is in China because they did not take the measures. They did not learn from China and South Korea and other countries. So a racist response, uh, a response that was about lecturing and finger pointing, you know, shaking the finger and belittling China like it was some dumb child uh, led to the, the exact situation where we did not make the adequate preparations in the West. And of course, our system itself was not capable of handling the crisis as well as the Chinese or the Cubans. So that means we have, we've had a large military buildup. We have exercises provoking Russia on Russia's borders. We have pivoted to Asia. If you look up what Obama did, he moved a lot of military forces to Asia to confront China. Enormous military spending, enormous trillions of dollars. The war on terror has cost more than $1 trillion. It costs millions of dollars every day. And yet there's not enough hospitals. The hospitals were running at overcapacity before the crisis. And they were being pushed to the limit before the crisis so that if a crisis hit, now you're gonna get the result that you get in a place like Italy where people are dying in the hallways and dying in the streets and being found dead in retirement homes. So that's why people have to care about foreign policy because we can learn from other countries. We can treat them respectfully, mutual respect and have a better situation here. China is bringing kits to Italy now, Russia, is uh, bringing 13 planes full of aid to Italy. They had to bypass NATO to do that. They had to bypass Polish airspace, which would not allow medical planes to travel to Italy. So that's why foreign policy is important because when you spend trillions of dollars on foreign policy and it's not available in your hospitals, that has consequences for the citizens. So we've been saying it this whole time that the money spent over there is not being spent over here. So I'm glad that that question was asked. Um, and uh, I, I have to ask a question on behalf of Paul here. Um, he posted a question within the uh, chat window because Paul does not have uh, a microphone. And uh, he was asking about, if I, if I have this correct, uh, yes, the, uh, since we're talking about China and the response, um, there's a, a story here about a Chinese doctor. Um, what Paul's question was, I just think, yeah, it was Paul. It says, big lies that provide the foundation for Western propaganda are, are built on small ones. So big lies are built on small ones. Demonization of anything remotely associated with communism means, uh, was this Chinese doctor that identified the virus and later died from it uh, arrested and jailed by the Chinese authorities. This is everywhere in the media as an example of the ever-present evils of communism. I'm trying to find the truth. Margaret did mention something earlier and I missed it. So what, uh, what 
Paul is asking here is there has been a story circulating, um, which has been seen, there's been video about a Chinese doctor who identified the danger or severity of the virus. And he was, uh, they said they were told he was suppressed and they didn't listen and so on. It's, they're basically putting forward a kind of Hollywood doctor story where everyone was ignorant of the disease and this, and this intrepid doctor found it and tried to report it and was told to shut up and they didn't listen and the disease got worse and worse and then he got the disease and died. So the question is, is this the Hollywood doctor story or does anyone know what happened with regard to that incident? Do you want to start, Danny? Or? Uh, no, you should start and then I'll... Okay, all right. Um, since I brought it up, yeah, we and I put in the chat, there's an article by uh, KJ No um, that we published on Popular Resistance that explains this, but uh, it was a doctor, doctor named Dr. Lee. He's an ophthalmologist and he had nothing to do with discovering the virus. He was not an infectious disease doctor, an epidemiolo epidemiologist or a virologist. He's an ophthalmologist, an eye doctor. And he did not blow a whistle. He did not contact any agencies to say, you know, anything. Uh, basically, he was in a small chat group and he was telling other doctors that what was going on was SARS, um, you know, the severe acute respiratory syndrome that is also a form of coronavirus that had happened prior. And he was, you know, kind of being very alarming and saying, oh, the SARS is back and this is terrible. And which wasn't true. And so he was summoned uh, in to, to talk about the fact that, you know, what he was doing was spreading misinformation. He had also shared some medical records um, violating the privacy of, of patients, which doctors should not do. And so he was just summoned and spoken to and, um, you know, told don't be alarming like that. And he was never arrested. He was never put in jail. And he did die, sadly. But this is a whole made up thing. It, you won't be surprised to hear. Yeah. And, you know, the timeline is also messed up. KJ No talks about in his article, he talks about how, you know, there had already been a doctor um, in Hubei Provincial Hospital who had already notified the hospital um, on December 27th of this cluster of viral cases, um, of a cluster of viral cases. And then two days later, the CDC was notified to begin research and investigation. So um, the whole Dr. Lee scandal happened a day later than that. And it was, as Margaret said, based on lies, uh, based on this idea that he had some sort of expertise on something when he really, he was just privately chatting. And in my personal experience being in China, one thing you learn is that there is actually a big right-wing opposition in China. Um, and so the Chinese Communist Party is very, and some of them take even left-wing um, uh, orientations in politics. And so they're very sensitive in a time of, of when there's foreign, uh, the possibility of foreign intervention always on the table, as well as these domestic insurgencies, which are basically uh, right wingers who want China to go capitalist and they want all assets to be sold off that these are some of the tactics that are used and especially in academia, the right wing in China is very prevalent. And so um, I am not surprised that the Chinese Communist Party would not listen to a random ophthalmologist who had no expertise about what they're talking about, uh, as well as they weren't whistleblowing anyone. They, they weren't trying to be helpful. They were trying to um, cause a hysteria. So I'm not surprised by the response. I think it was the correct one. Okay, um, thanks. Uh, we do have, uh, there's someone has been waiting to make a, a question. Uh, before I get to that, I should just quickly say, Margaret Flowers has made a post in the chat window. And in this post, she is referring to one of the articles that she had mentioned. Uh, so you can, you can get that link and it contains the information that had been asked about. Um, now it looks like Owen Ford has been waiting for a long time with his hand up. He is next in line. So uh, Lucia, if you could bring us over to Owen, we can put him on. Hello. Are we good to go here? Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. A really, uh, really stimulating, inspiring uh, discussion. Um, I, I don't want to go off too much on a tangent here, but I'm guessing I'm just throwing this out to anyone with an economics background. <clears throat> We've just seen these massive um, um, American, uh, uh, what are they, uh, interventions in the market uh, to, to the tune of trillions. Was it 1.3 trillion a week or so ago? And now this new uh, package, uh, two trillion more. And as we know, the feds are basically just pulling this money out of their arts. I mean, they're just writing numbers at this point. But uh, isn't that, isn't this like the late Rome fire where they're sort of debasing the coin of the realm? I mean, what have they got to back it up? Um, aren't they setting themselves up for some serious problems down the road? Uh, with all these huge outlays of money. Uh, mainly, as far as I can see, it's basically just the corporate sector, the oligarchs feeding at the trough, aren't they? I mean, I just wondered if anyone had some thoughts on that. Nobody wants to touch it. Uh, I'll touch it. Uh, um, I, I think your hunch is, is pretty correct from what I see, you know, I'm, I am consider myself an economist, but I consider myself a, a Marxist. And, um, you know, I think this stage of imperialism, especially led by the United States right now, there is this huge trend towards uh, devaluing and super exploiting the real economy in order to prop up what essentially is um, uh, glorified gambling um, in terms of what these financial institutions are doing. And yes, uh, you know, what just this coronavirus pandemic has shown is that um, an economic crisis even worse than 2007 2008 can happen merely because there is a social crisis um, like this. And all of this money, and, and you know, I, I'm not an expert on this, but yes, when you do pump money to save uh, the banks and you're saying you're pumping it out of thin air, uh, you're basically basing the value of that money on the faulty and destructive assets that you're supposedly bailing out. So now your money is completely tied to that. And the US dollar is not, you know, there's nothing backing it. Um, it and dollar hegemony is a huge issue right now worldwide. And it's going to be the cause of economic crises to come. Um, for many decades until um, it's destroyed. But I think one huge thing to remember here is that uh, really what is causing this um, intense uh, nervousness and uh, decision to sell off all these assets is the fact that now labor is in question. The, the idea that now workers are not going to be working and we may not be able to exploit them because the pandemic may either kill them or force them in their homes is causing all of this panic because the real economy is what is driven, the real capitalist economy is driven by labor. And without that, there is no profits. And that's, I think that's really at the heart of this issue. And it's not being talked about by anyone because they all want to talk about the money and they want to talk about the financial markets. But behind the financial markets is all the stuff that workers produce that won't get produced when they need to be bailed out when they can't produce it. Okay, um, it looks to me we uh, do have a question from Henry coming up, from Henry. Um, we, we're just at nine o'clock now. Uh, we cannot go on that much longer, but our question period, we have time for a little bit more. Uh, so uh, I know Henry's had his hand up. Uh, Lucia, could you please bring us to uh, Henry? Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Um, th this question, I, gu I guess, is for Phil. I had to step away for a few minutes, but I had to answer my landline. I'm one of the few people, I guess, who still has a landline. Um, Phil, I'm just wondering, uh, what, what, what uh, do you think about uh, the Canadian response to this, and and or, or lack of response? And I I'm also wondering if you have uh, any feelings on, on uh, Trump's billing, bringing the military to the Canadian border? Do you think that this, this pandemic is, is, is basically an excuse uh, for something he wanted to do for a while? Or do you think there's more behind it? Or, or... Mm -hmm. 
Can you hear me? Yeah, Phil, you're good to go. Oh, Danny, or did, uh, can I respond? <laughs> um, I think I'm. Uh, is I, this matter of the Canadian, the U.S. military at the border, it, it's going to be quite an education uh, for Canada because isn't this uh, poignant? We've had a cliche for quite a century or more that we have the longest undefended border in the world. Now it is the longest defended border. And uh, the reason it was undefended was we were all so brotherly and sisterly and we're all so close. But it turns out that unilaterally, Canada wasn't consulted. The, the U.S. government just decided. I, I just, moments before this we started this, I was watching Trump and he started talking about Canada in a very peculiar way about, you know, possible, you know, problems with uh, illegal passage. And he was actually, he got into his talking about steel, of all things. I don't think we're running steel across the borders in somewhere in Saskatchewan. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we've had this argument in Canada and it, and it was taken off the agenda. All the um, progressives of Canada in, in and I'll even include the NDP in that. They said that we're not, we shouldn't be in NATO. Well, now is going to be the time to think about that because if your NATO partner runs their soldiers up to your border, they're not your partner. I mean, or they don't consider you a partner. Um, and again, this should open everybody's eyes to multilateralism, developing, going back to the diplomatic strategy, which we were promised was coming. By the way, I think one of the reasons Trudeau was elected in the first place was he said he was going to improve relations. He was going to reset relations with Russia. He said that we should reopen our embassy in the um, uh, Islamic Republic. That was part of his campaign. And I remember very distinctly that they brought out Jean Chrétien, former prime minister, probably one of the more popular ones, particularly now in retrospect. And he said, uh, we've got to develop an independent policy. We should be, have better relations with Russia, China, and of course, open these, uh, <clears throat> reopen our embassies. And I would think we in Canada should say, open the embassies in the Islamic Republic, reopen relation, the embassy in Syria, end the sanctions, begin to be develop what you used to call an independent Canadian foreign policy. And by the way, you go to those NATO meetings where they're becoming more and more unpleasant with each other. The, the G7 did, meeting today was a good example. Pompeo came and he said, now we're going to call it the Wuhan virus in our statement from the G7. And the other members said, no, we're not going to make that statement. It's hard to say no. So they say you, you're not supposed to say no to the U.S., but uh, more and more countries are going to start saying no. And uh, I, in the U.S., they think they're circling the wagons. I would make that singular. They're circling the wagon. And Canada has a chance to get on board with other countries. Okay, thank you, Phil. Thank you, Henry, for the question. Um, it doesn't look like there's really many or any questions left at, at this point. We're going to close out soon. Uh, thanks for those who have stayed all this time, uh, even past our presumed nine o'clock finish time. Uh, I just have one question for our panelists. It was struck me after hearing from Margaret. Um, she was talking about the masks and the difficulty of getting masks delivered across borders or the shortages of masks in various places. And I was thinking of what you guys were saying about Russia and NATO. Um, so, I mean, we know recently that um, Italy, of course, was abandoned by the European Union. It asked for help from the glorious, magical European Union um, and all of its beneficial uh, civilization and, and everything it has to offer the world, and they weren't given anything. And so they, they turned to Russia and China. Uh, Russia has delivered a medical team and... Um, a large airlift operation. So now you have the case where they tried to get the masks across the Pol Polish border. As I said earlier, the Polish government said, 
you can't put the masks or the aircraft or anything across our border. They had to take a different route. And there's Russian medical team operating now inside Italy um, and not much in the way of EU or the United States. So what does it mean for NATO that um, you, you have this Russian presence there that was invited while it's being abandoned by NATO? Isn't NATO supposed to be there to protect Italy from Russia and China? Uh, can I jump back in? <laughs> well, the president of Serbia answered our question. He turned to the European states, and uh, th that's a NATO gang. And he said, uh, we'd like to buy some medical supplies. And they told him, uh, no. So he said, today I'm writing a letter to my brother, the president of China, my brother, Xi. Um, and NATO is... Uh, is showing itself as a state that, as conglomerate of states, it's actually not functional. We've, there's a danger of NATO fighting each other in the case of Turkey. Uh, there's been close calls with a war between uh, Turkey and other NATO members, and starting with the US. But years ago, you want to remember, NATO and Greece got into a war with each other. It's not a really a stable group. I think it's pasted together. Um, and I don't, we should accelerate the discussion. Why are we a member? And by the way, if we're a member, don't we have any say? Do we ever independently say anything? Uh, everybody has to, all these states have to find their voice. And, but we, we should congratulate the president of Sur Serbia, looking after for the best interests of his own people and sharing with them his feelings when he's treated in a cheap and noxious manner like that. And at, if the U.S. is going to send soldiers to the America, to the border with Canada, we should say it's time to come uh, be, speak frankly to Canadian people and uh, review all of our relations. If I could just add a little bit to that, I think that you know what socialist countries like Cuba and others show, and and you know like communist China is that. You know, they understand the concept of solidarity and internationalism and that we're all connected. And this is something that the European Union and the United States does not understand. And so we see it by the basically, um, you know, our states are competing with each other for supplies. The European Union is competing with each other instead of understanding that they should be working together. And, and we don't have the infrastructure to be able to quickly move our resources, reconfigure our industries, you know, do the things that we need to do. Even, you know, Venezuela mobilized very quickly and had people, you know, with sewing machines, sewing masks to increase their production. And that's something that the United States is just seems to be really incapable of. And it's to our demise. And I think that more and more, you know, what we're seeing is that the U.S.'s actions are isolating us and the actions of other countries are serving as examples for the world. And I think that, um, you know, that's why I think the U.S.'s powers really, it, and others are, analysts are saying it, that our power is really declining. And some are predicting, like Alfred McCoy, that, uh, that we will no longer be an empire by the end of this decade. <laughs> and I think also what Brendan was talking about with NATO, uh, what it was really exposed is that NATO has long been um, just an instrument of U.S. foreign policy, and that's exposed ever so now, where um, at this time, uh, NATO countries are supposed, what it's supposed to be, what NATO is supposed to be, is some sort of bulwark against Russia. Um, that's what it was created to do during the Soviet period, and that's what the entire imperialist world continues to say it is. Um, and while on the one hand that's true, on the other, um, every country within NATO is supposed to be subservient to the United States in its foreign policy interests. It's not that they work together. It's that the, the UK um, and all the Eastern European countries that have been engulfed in it, France, et cetera, are all supposed to just listen to what the United States does. And the coronavirus is a perfect example of how that's bitten them right in the ass. And um, I'm not surprised that there's going to be infighting and conflict within NATO about this because there are conflicting interests here, and um, some leaders, uh, regardless of who we like them or not, are not 
going to toe the line about this. And yes, it should, that should be highlighted because it's important um, when there's so much unity amongst the imperialists right now, any divisions are, are really worth exploiting. Yes, okay, so that's some thoughtful comments from our panel. Thank you so much. Um, looks like it's time to wrap things up. Uh, and so I guess what I want to do is just thank everyone who made this all possible today. And that includes the audience, the panelists, the committees, organizers. Um, we really appreciate the contributions of the panelists and everyone who commented or posted questions. Uh, <laughs> quite a number of interesting questions there. I guess as this pandemic drags on, we'll try to find more ways to reach you, whether that's by radio or podcasts or video or other means on social media and elsewhere. Um, Lucia has been taping this event uh, onto a cloud. So hopefully that process works and we'll try to make it available on YouTube or some other common medium in a few days. Um, and we thank uh, the person who made a donation today. Uh, I see that, uh, that that was registered in our chat session. So thank you very much. And if others want to donate to the coalition, you can send an interact transfer to the uh, email address. It's uh, hcsw at kojeco, that's c-o-g-e-c-o -E dot c-a. Uh, you can find that in email address probably in the contact us section on the website as well, or just contact us via there. Uh, so follow us on uh, Facebook and Twitter, especially Facebook, where there's regular posting. And uh, you can listen to unusual sources. Uh, normally, we're Wednesdays 5 to 6 p.m. But uh, with the station closure, we'll be podcasting over on SoundCloud and iTunes and so on. So that's everything for this uh, week for this session. Uh, the, this is the first event of its kind in Hamilton, as far as I know, a panel about imperialism online. So thanks for making this all possible. And uh, thanks to the panelists. Be sure to follow them all online because you can find them all. You can find Danny Haifong and Margaret Flowers and Phil Taylor in their various newspapers, journals, radio programs, and podcasts. So you can Google them and a whole bunch of results will come up. So thanks very much. Thanks for coming out. And uh, I suppose that's it for today. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.